Thank you. So I'm, first of all, let me ask uh, just by a quick show of hands, who's an engineer? Who's a programmer, developer? All right, all right. This is my, my kind of people. All right, so, so I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, Joe's been talking primarily about the, the left-hand side of, uh, of big data, the, the analytical side. I've got lots of data from different sensors or from uh, users contributing things. I'm going to crunch through that and spit out some recommendations or you know, action items for me to work on. Uh, and I'm, I'm, the, the NoSQL side of things is more about you know, I've got this uh, web application or software as a service, uh, and I need to scale that from you know, running inside one company to running for a whole country of users. So, so that, that's, that's the, the space that Cassandra plays in and that I think is interesting about uh, NoSQL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, five questions to ask as you think about uh, or, or, and evaluate different NoSQL solutions that will let you uh, make sense of the different uh, offerings out there because there's there's a lot of things. The problem with NoSQL as a as a term is that it's it's incredibly broad. Now you have things from uh, Cassandra uh, as a scalable system of record to uh, uh, Neo4j, which is a graph database that is mostly interested about data sets that fit on one machine. Uh, so very, very different kinds of products there. So I wanted to kind of break it down into uh, some questions you can ask to think about the differences uh, between these solutions and, uh, and what they are good at. And, and if, uh, as I go through, you, you start to think, wow, Cassandra is good at a lot of these things, then, uh, then I'm doing my job right. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, because I, I actually come to Cassandra, by the way, as uh, kind of a second generation of uh, people working on it. So it was open sourced by Facebook uh, back in 2008, and I came to it uh, from Rackspace uh, and uh, became the first committer to it in the Apache Foundation outside of Facebook. Uh, so I had the uh, opportunity to evaluate Cassandra uh, against uh, things like HBase and Voldemort and uh, MongoDB. Uh, so I was able to, to do this evaluation myself and, and, and uh, cho chose to get involved with Cassandra uh, because of some of the, the reasons that I'm going to discuss today. So uh, the first question I wanted to talk about is this one. How do I model my application? What does uh, building an application on different NoSQL databases look like? Uh, so there, there's a bunch of different options. Uh, of which I think the most interesting are uh, the document databases and the tabular ones, the ones that have tables of rows and columns. Uh, key value databases, those are out there. Uh, some of them are reasonably popular, uh, such as Voldemort. Uh, but uh, a key value, you, you know, a key value is kind of like a, a very simplistic. Uh, tabular database, you know, where you can have a row with a single column. That's that's my uh, my value, right? So uh, I'm I'm going to focus on those two, the document and the the tabular models. So the document model says I'm going to let you throw in balls of JSON, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript object notation, where I have uh, uh, fields uh, that are named and have values in there. And those can be strings. Uh, it turns out all my data types here are strings, but they can also be integers. Uh, at the bottom here, we have a list of email addresses. You can have uh, documents that contain other documents. Uh, it, it can be nested that way. So very uh, nice to use when you're prototyping something because you don't have to go in and say alter table uh, add column or anything like that. You just start, you know, you just throw in a new field to the JSON that you're handing to the server. Uh, now, C Cassandra kind of started off with this kind of uh, schemaless design, but what we found was as applications evolve, you start with, you typically start with one, uh, you know, kind of customer of the database, one, one code base that's interact, interacting with that database. But as, uh, as you evolve that, you start adding on different parts 
uh, that are often authored by different teams other than the original one. So you might have some uh, Python to go with your Ruby, uh, add in some uh, analytics with uh, maybe Hive, uh, you add in a, a Java component. And so, and the database is shared between all of these. And so what, what you have is, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the schema-less approach, uh, all of those uh, teams besides your original one Try, have to go back to that code base to figure out what it's doing with the database. So I, my claim is that having a schema that lets you ask things like, you know, what does this user's table look like is actually a good thing. So that's the direction we've moved uh, with Cassandra actually to, towards uh, allowing and encouraging you to uh, tell the database what is what are, what you are actually putting in it, so that that can be the source of truth for everyone who touches that data. So, uh, we've also found that uh, SQL, as much as it gets, uh, th there's some people who came to NoSQL because they don't like SQL, uh, and that's not me. You know, I, th I think SQL is actually very good at what it's supposed to do, which is giving you a domain-specific language for defining and accessing data. Uh, so what we've done with Cassandra is uh, we've actually created a subset of SQL, uh, and all of, these, all of these statements on this uh, slide here are valid CQL, valid Cassandra query language. Create table, create index, uh, select star, uh, and give it some where predicates. Those are all valid CQL. Now, uh, an interesting uh, kind of mismatch between SQL and what we're doing uh, with Cassandra and, and other NoSQL databases is that SQL is very much uh, organized towards thinking of your data as normalized uh, tables. So if I wanted to create a, a relation in the relational world uh, between users and email addresses. I want to allow users to have multiple email addresses. I would do something like this, where I have uh, a table of email addresses. It has a many-to-one relationship with my users table. Uh, and then when I access it, I access it by saying select a natural join or you know, left outer join, something like that, to get those uh, email addresses out. And so this is, this is a, a non-starter uh, in the NoSQL world. Uh, join, joins are a dirty word for us because uh, we are, we're targeting a space where we're scaling across multiple machines. We don't want to have to fetch data from machines ac across the cluster to join them together. That's going to kill our performance. So what we do instead is we denormalize. So in the document model that I showed you earlier, the denormalization looks like, looks like this, where in the red here, I have email addresses as a list, and I can just put that into the document like that. Uh, with, with Cassandra, uh, we're taking a more schema-oriented approach, and so we, we have this uh, syntax here for the create table. In the red again, we have email addresses is a set of text, and so we're telling the database that, that this is what that's going to be, and then I can write uh, an update statement like the one below that that says, uh, append or, or create a union of email addresses with this new set that I'm giving you. So uh, the Cassandra query language, uh, it, it does away with joins as well as subqueries. And then a little bit, maybe a little bit less intuitively, uh, we also don't give you uh, uh, aggregation or uh, any of that kind of nature, because what we're saying is Cassandra is strictly about uh, being the system of record for, your, for serving your application. If you want to go analyze it later and say, you know, who are my top, top 10 users in contributing new content, you know, go ahead and do that offline uh, with, with our Hive integration or that'll let you run Hadoop uh, map reduce jobs against it and come back with that data. So we're not, we're not encouraging you to do this 
kind of analysis, analytical query against your live database. Uh, and I'll show you how, how we split that up in a, in a, towards the end of my presentation. Um, the last thing, though, that's interesting is, is how we deal with order by. Uh, it's kind of like uh, what Henry Ford said about his cars. You can have any ordering you want in Cassandra as long as you pick it up front. Uh, so what that what that means is I'll give you I'll give you an example. So in in the relational world, uh, here is here is what uh, a, a toy Twitter application might look like. I have users users make tweets and users follow other users. So what I my, the main query that I'm concerned with. Uh, in this Twitter application is, what tweets have my friends made? So, so here we are uh, looking up the tweets for a user named DriftX. Uh, we're, we're saying, what tweets have his friends made? So what we first need to do is look up in the red who his friends are, and then for each of those friends, we look up in the blue what tweets they've made. Right? So, so here we're, we're doing uh, a join through a, through a subquery. So I've, I've already said that we don't do joins uh, in Cassandra. So the way we would do this in Cassandra would be, I would, I would create a separate table in which I will put the tweets of every user's friends, if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do here, so the, I've got create table timeline, user ID is going to be the user whose friends' tweets we're trying to ask about. So DriftX in this example. And then each of those next four fields, the tweet ID, the tweet author, and tweet body, those are, that's going to be the tweet data that we're going to denormalize into this new table. So every time someone makes a tweet, we're not just going to insert one row into the tweets table. We're going to insert potentially dozens or hundreds of rows into the timeline table, one for each person who's following him. And then the, inter the interesting part about this is you can see that I've created a compound primary key at the bottom of the table here. That I have a compound primary key on user ID and tweet ID. So uh, when, when you give Cassandra a compound primary key, it breaks that up and says the first part, the user ID, that's going to be the partition key. That's going to determine what servers this row gets replicated on. The remaining parts of that uh, primary key, the user ID, uh, sorry, the tweet ID here, I'm going to cluster the data within that partition on, on that tweet ID. So I'm going to sort or order that data by tweet ID. So that's what, what I've got with the orange arrow here. That's what I'm trying to indicate here is that you know, each of these orange groups is a partition. They have the same user ID. And then the orange arrow is denoting that I'm sorting those rows within that partition by tweet ID. So that when I do this query at the bottom here in Cassandra and I say select star from timeline where user ID equals DriftX, I can say order by tweet ID if I want. It's redundant because it's doing that automatically. I can say that. I can also say order by tweet ID descending. So Cassandra will get, can do that efficiently, either forwards or backwards, ascending or descending. But I can't, I can't say select uh, order by author. I can't, Cassandra will say, no, I can't do that. I would have to do, I, I would have to sort potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of rows at runtime, and I, I might not be able to do that performantly. So if you, want, if you want another ordering, you should denormalize that into another table ordered in, the, in, that, in that way, if that's what you want. So uh, uh, the, the next natural question then in our progression is to ask, how do these different NoSQL solutions perform? So one, one way to think about that is, is well, OK, I, I'll, I'll run a benchmark. Uh, so a group of uh, academics at the University of Ottawa in Canada uh, presented a paper at the Very Large Databases Conference uh, this year. And uh, they, 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 ran, they ran about half a dozen different workloads 
Uh, and then and they measured that as you scale the cluster, uh, how does the performance look? And uh, and this is this is just one of the workloads. Uh, Cassandra uh, did very well in performance, uh, but we actually want to look a little bit deeper than a graph like this. Because what, what you have to do to create a graph like this, they're comparing uh, Cassandra and HBase, which are tabular databases, uh, with uh, Redis, which is sort of a key value database, with MySQL, which is obviously a relational database. So you actually have to, to make a graph like this. Uh, they used a benchmark suite called YCSB, the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. Uh, which actually takes a lowest common denominator approach and says, we're just going to give everyone key values, pairs, uh, to read and write. So uh, it's a very limited kind of test when you're comparing systems as different as these, which is why just looking at a graph, uh, you know, I like this graph because Cassandra is winning, uh, but but you'd want, you want to look deeper and you want to understand as I move beyond uh, keys and values and try to use the database the way it's meant to be used, what kinds of uh, performance can I expect? What is it good at? What is it not so good at? So uh, one of the things that, that uh, one of the most important aspects uh, in a scalable database is what is, it, what is its approach to locking? You know, as, as you start scaling across more and more machines, as you have more and more uh, clients hitting it, uh, what is the approach to locking and concurrency? Uh, Cassandra's approach is to use uh, what, what are called uh, persistent collections. Uh, rather, than having, rather than locking rows explicitly uh, for reads and writes, uh, we use what are called p persistent collections, which means that um, I, my row, my copy of a row that I, that I know about is actually immutable. And when I go to change it, I actually clone that row and make the changes in the clone, which then becomes the new, uh, the, the new row of record once my changes are complete. And so what, what, what this, what this uh, diagram is showing is how um, these persistent data structures, um, you can actually, sh when, when I clone that row, it's not an expensive operation because my new copy of that row actually shares most of the information with the old one. It's a copy on write design is basically what it is. Uh, we're using uh, a, a library called SnapTreeMap is, is the actual specific implementation we're using there. Uh, which is very, it, it's very useful because not only does it give us this copy on write uh, performance, but it also uh, preserves ordering uh, within a partition, which is one of the, the things we want to give users was within your partition key, everything is clustered uh, on the rest of your primary key. Another important part of performance is efficiency. And this is what I mean by efficiency. If I go through and, if, and say, update users, append this new email address, do I, do I rewrite that entire user record, which a lot of NoSQL databases do, or do I just append that new data? So obviously, that, that's, that's going to affect how many operations per second of this type that I can do if I'm having to rewrite everything that was in that, uh, in that row or in that document. Uh, another important question that's related to performance, it's not about performance specifically, but it, it impacts your performance, is durability. So this is the same durability as in ACID, in relational databases. If I give you my data and say, write this data, and you tell me, yes, I have written your data, and then uh, you lose power, is my data still there? That's durability. So, so to, to answer these questions for Cassandra, um, Cassandra uses what's called a log structured storage engine. So what we're going to do is when, when a write comes in, uh, in the upper left, we're, what, the first thing we do is we append that write to the commit log. So that's the thing that's in the left here, uh, in the middle, that's, that's my commit log. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just append, 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 append to that commit log. 
Uh, similar design that uh, Oracle, PostgreSQL, et cetera, all of these use uh, commit log like this. Uh, they might call it a transaction log or write ahead log. It's the same thing. Uh, so, so that's what gives Cassandra durability, is we, we always uh, put your data in a commit log first uh, so that it's on disk. Uh, and then the next thing we do is we, we put it in this thing. You, you might not be able to see the gray on gray there, but it's a structure called a mem table uh, and on the upper part of the screen. So I'm, I'm going to, as writes come in, I'm going to batch them up in this mem table. I'm not, I'm not doing any random I.O. You know, I'm, I might be changing data that already exists somewhere, but I'm just appending that, uh, I'm, I'm appending to the commit log and writing to the mem table. I'm, I'm not doing any random I.O. on disk. When the mem table gets full, then I will write it to disk. And I will, I will write out those rows in sorted order, and, and uh, at, at which point it becomes uh, what we call an SS table file on disk and can be uh, uh, queried on disk, uh, whereas before we were just querying the memory. So uh, the, the importance of this is that we're never doing random writes, which actually turns out to be the right thing to do, both for rotational disks and for solid state disks. Uh, rotational disks is the right thing to do because seeks are expensive. So we don't want to do random writes for that reason. On solid state disks, uh, they're not expensive for performance so much as they're expensive for your disk's lifespan. So there, there's a, a concept called write amplification with uh, solid state disks. I don't have time to go into that today, but uh, if, if you Google for Cassandra solid state disks, uh, this is a presentation that a fellow named Rick Branson gave, and he'll, he goes into the gory details of uh, how write amplification affects SSDs and uh, why that makes log-structured storage engines a good fit. The last thing I wanted to mention with respect to performance is that it's important to know how a database deals with larger-than-memory data sets. Uh, this is uh, a graph from a company called Urban Airship, where they were using uh, a non-Cassandra uh, NoSQL database. I've blacked out the name of the database because that's that's not really I'm, I'm not I don't really want to uh, call anyone out by name here, but I, I do want to point out uh, what happened here when their data set got larger than RAM, the performance went through the floor. And so you want to be careful ab about this and, and, and ask, how does this database deal with data sets larger than memory? Because if, if your data set fit in memory, then you might as well be using Oracle. You might as well be using MySQL, right? Uh, what, the, the interesting part about NoSQL to me is not about getting rid of the relational data model. It's about... How, uh, going beyond the relational data model to scale. That's the important part. Uh, so if we don't need to scale, you know, who cares? If you do need to scale, then you need to know, you know how, do, how does the database deal with this situation? Another thing you, want, you need to know about is how do, you deal, how do you handle failure? Because once we've spread our data across multiple machines in a cluster, it's not as simple anymore as when my database is down, I can't get to my data, right? Hopefully, we're in a situation where if I lose one machine, the rest of the cluster can deal with that and I still have my data. That's what we want. So there's, there's a couple ways to uh, scale out uh, and, and, and design for this. Uh, kind of the classic model that you would probably end up with if you, were, if you started with uh, MySQL and then needed to shard across um, multiple MySQL machines, you'd probably end up with something like this, where uh, you have, here I have four partitions or shards, each of which has a light blue machine, which is my master. And then the master replicates to the dark blue machines that are, that are just read-only replicas. They don't handle writes. They're, they're just uh, there as backups, basically. So in, in this situation, if, if the master node goes down, then 
I need to have a new master election. I promote one of the replicas to be master, and I carry on from there. Well, there there's a, a couple problems with this, uh, which philosophically, I think this is the wrong approach. Uh, first of all, because while you're doing that master election and, and, fail, and doing the failover to, a, to a, a new replica, you have unavailability. You can't handle new rights while you're doing the failover. Maybe your failover is super quick. You know, that's, what you, that's hopefully what you're shooting for. But you still have uh, a small amount of downtime. Uh, the second problem is kind of what, what Rick's referring to in this, in this second quote here, excuse me, uh, which is that in, in a master-slave design, failover is a rare occurrence. Uh, if it's not rare, then you have lots of downtime during failover. So, but, but since it is rare, it's relatively untested. And you have lots of corner cases that you need to deal with. For instance, what if my, my, blue, my light blue master, it's not really down, but it lost network connectivity. So it still thinks that it's the master. So I fail over to a new master. The first master regains connectivity. Now I have two masters. So not, not a good situation. So dealing with that kind of corner case is, is where the, the pain comes in with this kind of scenario. Uh, Google App Engine, that, where they run uh, kind of a, a data store as a service as part of App Engine, they've had uh, two day-long outages because of master failover uh, with this kind of scenario. So even Google, with you know, six years more experience with this than most of us, uh, still struggles with this. And I think that's inherent to the design. So. Uh, what does Cassandra do instead? After I've explained why I think this, this master design is bad, what, do, what does Cassandra do instead? Um, we have a, a fully distributed uh, system, by which I mean uh, every node uh, is a master, in the sense that I can always accept rights for any replica and, and forward that data where it needs to go. So in, in, in this diagram, I have the client talking to a node in the upper left for data that's on these other three nodes. So the, the, uh, the machine the client is talking to does not own the data, which, which is a good thing because if that node fails, I can reconnect to any other node in the cluster and it will also be able to route it to the right place. Uh, so one of the things that this gives me by having every node be a master in this sense is I can actually have clusters that span multiple data centers. And clients in each data center can talk to a Cassandra node locally, which will then forward it where it needs to go anywhere in the cluster. By the way, what I've tried to do with this uh, diagram here is, is show two data centers that are on-premise and two data centers in the cloud. Uh, we actually have customers uh, with this exact scenario, where they have uh, it's spread between their machines and Amazon's machines, and cluster, uh, Cassandra connects all of that together in a single cluster. Uh, we do this efficiently, by the way, where if I'm forwarding a write to a new data center, and that new data center has three, three copies of the data, I'll just send one copy over the WAN link and have that uh, one of those replicas forward it to the others locally. So it's efficient like that. Cassandra also takes care of uh, healing itself uh, in, the, in the situation I mentioned earlier where you know, one of my replicas goes down and it starts to miss uh, uh, updates. So in a, in a completely healthy system, uh, the, res the request uh, life cycle will go something like this, where the client will make a request to the coordinator node, which will send that data to the replica node, which will respond to the co coordinator node that everything went fine, which will then send the response to the client. Now, what, now when, when things don't go right, if the replica fails, then the coordinator will have to reply to the client that, hey, 
uh, something went wrong. The, the replica didn't acknowledge the right. So I'm going to, I, I, I waited for a while. It never got back to me. So I'm going to have to say that uh, I'm going to have to tell you that it, it timed out. But what I also do before I tell the client that it timed out is I store a hint. Uh, and a hint means that I'm going to, to store a copy of the, the update that the client gave me. And so when that replica uh, regains health or connectivity, I will then forward to that replica uh, the update that it missed. So that's, that's one way that, that we deal with uh, uh, self-healing in Cassandra. Uh, we also have um, a more heavyweight repair, which is called anti-entropy repair. Uh, and what, what that's useful for is, you know, in our, in our diagram here where the coordinator has hints on it, well, what, what happens if the coordinator dies too before the replica comes back up and it wasn't able to send those hints to it? Then we have to do uh, what we call uh, anti-entropy repair with one of the other replicas. It's basically our sync for databases where we go through and we say, what data do you already have? Here is the data that you don't have. Maybe more interesting is how do you deal with partial failures? So here's a situation where I have three replicas of this data and the node in the upper right is 90% busy. So it's going to be slower responding to my requests. And so what Cassandra does is it actually tracks how each replica is performing and will route requests to the replica that's least busy. So often what, what you'll see happen uh, is that you know, disk failure will often, you know, if the disk won't just die, it will get really slow first. And so what you want to be able to do is handle the scenario where the, the node is nominally alive, but it's, it's, you know, it's slowed down, it's sick, and, and route requests away from that. So Cassandra does that uh, as part of its normal operation so that no matter what it is that's making the node slow, uh, we deal with that situation naturally. So, you know, I've, I kind of talked a little bit and waved my hands about uh, Cassandra architecture and why that makes it good. Uh, but the, the proof is in, uh, you know, what, what the boots on the ground see, what, uh, what people running Cassandra actually experience. So I really, I like Bill's quote at the top here that Cassandra is kind of indestructible. Um, you know, that, that's really the design that we're shooting for, that there's no single points of failure. Um, you lose machines, it keeps on going. Uh, the middle quote here is, is about a, an Amazon outage. Uh, you may have noticed that US West, if you're deployed uh, uh, across uh, American data centers, US, West, uh, US East keeps going down for Amazon. Um, so when Netflix uh, uses Cassandra extensively, uh, when U.S. East went down, no problem. You know, the, the other data centers kept going. So re related to this, uh, uh, designing for, for failure is you know, the scalability question. How does it scale? What's the design for scale? Um, again, coming back to this slide that I showed you earlier, uh, you want, as, as, the, as the number of nodes grows, you want the performance to keep growing. And ideally, you want that performance to keep growing in a straight line. Now, 12 nodes isn't a whole lot. That's as far as the, the VLDB uh, benchmark went. So uh, Netflix actually did a benchmark scaling up to 288 nodes. Uh, at, at that point, they were doing about 1.1 million writes per second. Uh, so again, we see that the, the uh, the line is nice and straight. You know, that, that's what we want to see. Uh, and interestingly, this, this was, uh, uh, they were doing three replicas for each of these writes. So this cluster is actually doing 3.3 uh, .3 million uh, physical writes per second uh, to, handle, to handle this workload. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on scaling because if, if you have a, a fully distributed system, then scaling is mostly a matter of not doing the wrong things. 
Uh, you know, you don't want to have you don't want to have a metadata server that clients have to connect to to find out where their data is. Um, you you don't want to have uh, router nodes that that become a bottleneck. Um, what about when you're adding capacity? This is actually a tough one. The third one here is actually tough. When you add capacity uh, to your cluster, that means we have to move data to the new nodes. How do we do that while creating the least impact possible on the existing nodes in the cluster? This is something that, that we, we worked on for a while with Cassandra. It took us a while to get it right. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is flexibility. Uh, and, and there's a lot of... Uh, ways you can look at flexibility. Uh, but uh, one of the ways that, that we tackle this with, with Cassandra, uh, and at, at Datastack specifically, uh, what we do is we allow you to um, do what I was talking about earlier and, and run analytical queries against your Cassandra data uh, in, the in a single cluster. And the way we do that is, uh, in, in this diagram, my blue nodes, those are my my live application, real-time-ish nodes. And we're going to keep a copy of the data on these green nodes. So you, you may not be able to read it. That says analytics for Hadoop on those green nodes. So those are going to have their own copy of all my data. I don't need to have multiple copies. I'll just put a, I'll put, I'll just put a single copy on those. There'll probably be machines with more disk uh, than, uh, than the blue nodes. Because you know, I, all I'm going to be doing is basically doing sequential scans, doing uh, doing my analysis uh, against those. So, as as an example, uh, we have a, a demo application uh, that we ship called the Portfolio Manager demo. And what this is is um, for for each of these um, each of these boxes represents a user's stock portfolio. So he has a, a certain allocation of each stock in his portfolio, and we, we know how much the portfolio is worth, uh, its gain or loss for the day. But what we don't know, uh, because it's, it, it's something we can't compute without doing a bunch of joins and subqueries, what we don't know is the largest historical 10-day loss. So what we do is we actually use uh, the Hadoop integration to calculate that, the largest historical 10-day loss, and replicate that back to the real-time side uh, for presentation in this uh, manager view. So the way we do this is we have uh, three tables in, uh, in the uh, application that we're going to deal with here. We have uh, a live stocks table that says what is the price of a stock at this exact point in time right now. Then we have the portfolios table that says, this is how many shares uh, user X owns of stock Y. And then we have a historical table of what was the stock's closing price uh, for, for these uh, prior uh, dates. So what we're going to do uh, is we, we want to uh, compute uh, historical 10-day loss that's going to look something like this. For every portfolio, uh, what was its largest 10-day loss and when was it? So we're actually going to compute that in, in several steps. First, we're going to compute for each stock what was its 10-day uh, uh, return on each closing date. And so we're, we're going to do that with, this is, this is a, a Hive query uh, that, that you can run against Cassandra. Uh, so it's a dialect of SQL. We're going to be doing a, a self-join from the stock history table to itself across, across 10 days worth of data, and then we're going to, we're going to sum that up. Uh, the next thing we're going to, the next step in our computation is going to be for each portfolio what was its 10 day what was its 10 day return on each date so here we're going we're going to join that 10 days return that we just computed we're going to join that with portfolios and and query that then the the final step is to take that portfolio and uh, portfolio returns table that we computed and join those together to get a single row for each portfolio with the largest 10 day loss 
So uh, this, this is what we bring to Cassandra uh, at Datastax, is uh, integrating uh, the uh, real-time uh, system of record side with the Hadoop analytical side, with management tools, uh, and I don't have time to talk about today, but we also integrate it with uh, Solar Search uh, to, to give you a full text search against your Cassandra data. Um, today, my, my best guess is that there are over a thousand Cassandra deployments in production out there. Uh, these are a few of them. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really seeing uh, a ton of adoption from companies that you know, need to move beyond you know, their, their MySQL or their Oracle installation and uh, make that scale. So uh, I think I have time for one or two questions. He's not glaring at me, so yeah, I'll take by, by it. <laughs> by, uh... I can repeat your question. Okay. So by replicating the data over so many master nodes and you have not having any slave nodes, Aren't you just moving the memory issue from one side to another side? So now I got great indexes and I can go and look up my data faster, but I have to process more data on the back. Yeah, so the question is, uh, well, let, let, me, let me ask a slightly different question. Uh, the slightly different question would be, <laughs> this is the question he meant to ask. Uh, do, does, does Cassandra replicate all your data to each node? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, you, you tell Cassandra how many copies of your data you want in each data center. Uh, so I didn't make this clear, that, that was my fault. Um, I said that each node is a master, and by that I don't mean that it needs all of the data replicated to it, I just mean that it's able to handle and route queries for any data and send it to the right nodes. So I could have, uh, you know, frequently people have clusters of uh, dozens or hundreds of nodes, and they will have uh, three copies of their data, or, or sometimes uh, three copies in each of two data centers for a total of six copies. So that, that's uh, a more common way to do that. One more question. Yes, I didn't understand how do you avoid uh, random IOs. Could you explain it again, please? Catch me outside. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really have time right now, but the basic idea is uh, that uh, we, gr we group your updates uh, in memory before we write them out as data files. So we're not actually, if, if I have user JBLS with uh, password X and I change my password to password Y, I don't actually go to that old row and overwrite it. What I do is, is that new password becomes part of a new data file that I, that, that I write out sequentially. And then what I do is in the background, if I have older data files, in the background I go through and I merge those data files together also sequentially, which I can do because I've written them out in sorted order. And so, uh, and, and that background process is called compaction. So that lets me avoid doing the random writes. And if that doesn't make sense, Catch me outside. <laughs>